two of our time together will feature Dennis Rooney. Dennis has been a member of ARSC, a producer of classical recordings for major labels, and a media commentator for a very long time, perhaps even longer than he can remember. Uh, he served as a member of ARSC's technical committee since 1996. He's been a reviewer and contributor to the Strad magazine, the BBC music magazine, the Classic Record Collector, the American Record Guide, and Musical America. He's a veteran producer of historic classical reissues. He was a key member of the team that helped create the, many of the original Mercury Living Presence uh, series, an LP that many of us remember very well, as well as one who put together the Sony Classical Masterworks Heritage series, which uh, unfortunately didn't go as far as it should have. Most important though, uh, Dennis is a, a seasoned pro who always brings a penetrating class act perspective to whatever he does. Dennis, we're delighted you're here, and uh, you're on, man. The floor of my career. Well, Al, thank you as usual for the generous introduction. I do have to correct the record, however. I worked with Wilma Fine on a discography of the Minnesota Orchestra. I had many conversations with her about Mercury. I never had my hand in the Mercury reissues. That was a that was a mutual friend. So, in any event, I am here today to talk to you about Eugene Goosens, and eventually we'll get his photograph up here. There he is. Thanks to my colleague and good morning to everybody. Born on the 26th of May, 1893, into a British musical family of Belgian origins, Eugene Ainsley Goosens bore the same name as his father and grandfather, both of whom were conductors. His father, as you can see, had one of the great beards. Among his siblings, Leon became renowned as an oboist, sister Sidney was a celebrated orchestral harpist, and Adolf played the horn. In a succession of family photographs, we first see our subject in 1898 holding a bugle, then a family outing in 1902 with uh, the mother in the middle, as you might expect, and then a young Eugene conducting his siblings in 1904. After early musical studies in Bruges and Liverpool, he received a scholarship to the Royal College of Music, where he studied violin with Achille Rivard and composition with Charles Villiers Stanford. From 1912 to 1915, he was a violinist in the new Queen's Hall Orchestra. His career as a conductor really began the next year, when he conducted Stanford's opera, The Critic, at the invitation of Sir Thomas Beecham, who later made Goosens his assistant conductor. In June 1921, with the composer present, Goosens conducted an especially assembled orchestra in Queen's Hall for the first British concert performance of Stravinsky's Le Sacre du Pantin. The next year, he conducted both opera at Covent Garden and Diaghilev's Ballet Russe. In 1923, Goosens was invited by George Eastman to become conductor of the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra, where he remained until 1931. He shared the post for the first two seasons with Albert Coates due to Eastman's desire not to put all of his conductorial eggs in one basket. Goosen's duties also involved teaching at the Eastman School of Music, where one of his colleagues, the uh, tenor Vladimir Rosing, was in charge of the opera program to which Goosen's contributed. As a conductor of the Rochester Philharmonic, Goosen's provided his audiences with nourishing helpings of Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, Wagner, and somewhat smaller portions of Brahms and Mozart. The classics were balanced with new works, including those of Howard Hansen, Eastman's director at the time, and many novelties by English, French, and Italian composers. Big-name soloists were not much in evidence in the Rochester of those days, 
where the emphasis was on local talent, but the quality was high. In Rochester, Goosens began a pattern that persisted for most of the next 25 years, spending winters in the United States and summers abroad, usually in England. Goosens made his first recordings in 1922. Either during his first or second summer back in England, he made the first complete recording of Stravinsky's Petrushka for HMV, conducting the Royal Albert Hall Orchestra. It was also issued in Vict uh, by Victor in this country on its Blue Label series in a special album. The acoustic recording process, then nearing its end, seems to intensify the strangeness of music that was still new and unfamiliar. Here is the coachman's dance. electrical recording in 1925, Goosens continued to enlarge his discography. On the 15th of July, 1926, he recorded the second suite from Bizet's La Lésienne. It was made with the Royal Opera House Orchestra of Covent Garden, and it sounds as if it was recorded there. Wherever, it is a good sounding capture of a blazing account of the Farandole.
whose first American recording took place in September 1928, when he recorded a group of short pieces with the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra, issued by Victor as its set 40. The label included the Bowl's motto, Music Under the Stars, which in the Los Angeles area of 85 years ago was still accurate. <laughs> Recorded in the bowl itself, the orchestra is quite tightly mic'd and sounds unatmospheric. Here is a brief excerpt of Casella's orchestration of Balakirev's virtuoso piano piece, Islame. <laughs> Here are Goosens and Henry Wood at the latter's country house in 1932. The previous year, Goosens succeeded Fritz Reiner as conductor of the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. And here is how they sounded in 1938 on the stage of Cincinnati's Music Hall in a live concert broadcast in the NBC Magic Key series. The music is a work by Goosens himself, Bacchanal. We'll hear just a bit of it. That's what you could hear on network radio in 1938. It would not be until 1941 that Goosens began recording commercially in Cincinnati. The catalyst was probably the decision by Columbia Records, acquired by CBS in 1939, to have the price of its 12-inch Masterwerk discs to one dollar. At the same time, it signed up both the Cleveland Orchestra under Arta Rodzinski and the Minneapolis Symphony under Dimitri Metropolis. In response, Victor began signing up other provincial American orchestras, Indianapolis and Fabian Savitsky, San Francisco and Pierre Monteux, Washington's National Symphony and Hans Kindler, Rochester, recording as the Eastman Rochester Orchestra with Howard Hansen, and as the Rochester Philharmonic with Hosea Turby, and Cincinnati. In February of that year, Victor sent a crew to Music Hall. Three works were recorded over a span of as many days. The best known is the Walton Violin Concerto with Yasha Heifetz. Tchaikovsky's Symphony No. 2, known as Little Russian, was recorded the next day, followed by Vaughan Williams's A London Symphony. It was that work's third recording, but the only one to present the second version of it, a 1920 version, uncut. By 1941, Vaughan Williams had produced a third version of the score and demanded that all earlier ones be suppressed. So we can only be grateful that the exigencies of wartime conditions probably caused Oxford University Press, VW's publisher, to miss out what was going on. The recording thus acquired an historical importance that no one imagined at that time. I first heard it on a Camden LP reissue, credited to the Cromwell Symphony there, 
And to this day, I vividly recall the effect it had on me at the age of 16. Here is part of the scherzo. Not only did those 1941 sessions yield the best sound Goosen's ever got in Cincinnati, they were also among Victor's best orchestral recordings made anywhere between the mid-30s and the early 50s. Goosen's programmed more adventurous repertoire in Cincinnati than in Rochester. He remained a committed Stravinskyan. The Second Viennese School seemed not to interest him at all. An example of his concern for programming is this letter to the violinist Vino Franciscati. And if you can't read the text very easily, it says, Cher ami, forgive my troubling you so soon before your next season's appearance, but I am anxious to know what you would like to play at our concert here. Naturally, you cannot repeat either the Paganini or the Lalo, though I understand that either Atlanta or Mobile, in one of which cities you are also playing with our orchestra on tour, wants the Paganini. Now, about one of the big Vuitton, or one of the Vinyovsky concerti, or is there anything else you can think of? Frankly, I'm tired of the Beethoven and Brahms, and Mozart is hardly a brilliant enough vehicle for you. <laughs> Warmest regards, etc. In 1942-43, Goosens commissioned a series of fanfares from various American composers as stirring and significant contributions to the war effort. Aaron Copeland responded with his fanfare for the common man, the most celebrated and enduring of the 18 works commissioned. Here is another, Paul Creston's fanfare for paratroopers, which Goosens conducted with the Cleveland Orchestra in Severance Hall on the 30th of January, 1944. Petrillo Band shut down recording in the U.S. from mid-1942 until late 1944. 
RCA Victor, as it was known by that time, brought a crew to Music Hall in January 1945. Here is a portion of Stravinsky's Le Chant de Rossignol, recorded on the 25th of that month. <laughs> From 1947 to 1956, Goosens was in Australia, having left Cincinnati to become the conductor of the Sydney Symphony Orchestra and simultaneously the head of the New South Wales State Conservatorium of Music. By all accounts, he raised the standards of both institutions considerably. Part of his activities included a plan to build an opera house in Sydney, and he was instrumental in selecting the waterfront site where it was eventually situated. His musical autobiography, Overture and Beginners, was published in 1951 and reprinted by Greenwood Press in 1972. For his services to music in Australia, he was knighted by the Queen in 1955. But in March 1956, a sex scandal caused him to resign both his positions and leave Australia summarily. For those interested in the details of what now seems a tempest in a teapot, uh, there is a handout that has been distributed uh, of a transcript of an Australian television program which recounts the affair in salacious detail. <laughs> the final six years of Goosens' life were difficult. Although he enlarged his discography considerably beginning in 1958 by recording for the newly established Everest label. As he was not under contract to any other label at that time, he was kept busy by Everest for most of the next two years. Goosens had conducted the premiere of Australian composer John Antill's ballet, Corroboree, and had recorded it in Australia in 1950. A stereo version was one of his earliest Everest recordings. Here is a portion of the fire dance as recorded in Walthamstow Assembly Hall with the London Symphony Orchestra in 1958. Thank <laughs> you. 
The last excerpt is from another Everest recording, Etor Villalobos' Little Train of Caipira, the Toccata movement that concludes his Bacchiana Brasileira No. 2, written in 1930. The subtitle refers to the local trains in the small communities of the Brazilian interior, the noises of which are imitated in the orchestra, rather like Oniger's Pacific 231. Let's have a drink. In 1958, Sir Thomas Beecham engaged Goosens to orchestrate, or reorchestrate, I should say, Handel's Messiah for a planned RCA recording that Beecham was to conduct. However, Beecham was displeased with the work of his former assistant conductor and made many changes himself, or claimed he did. Sir Eugene Goosens died on the 13th of June, 1962. His most enduring legacy, besides his discography, is the Sydney Opera House. His lobbying the New South Wales government to build a music performance venue and his urging that the site be on a point overlooking Sydney Harbour led to that site eventually being chosen, although not until one year after his departure from Australia. The completed building would not be dedicated until a decade after his death. His image, however, is prominently on display in its lobby. Goosens' recordings reveal skill in obtaining excellent results, often with limited rehearsal time. One also hears his uncommon insight into style and character, a wonderfully subtle ability to bring off rallentando, ritenuto, accelerando, and stringendo, and a keen grasp of phrasal tension and how to keep the line constantly energized, all of which can be heard in his recordings and I hope you have enjoyed, despite their ridiculously abbreviated length, hearing some of them this morning. My sincere thanks to Seth Winner for preparing them, which required extensive restoration in some cases, and for operating the CD player. 
Alan Lisitsky, Carl Miller, Tom Fine, Richard Markowitz, and Fred Fellers generously loaned source. My thanks to all of them and to you for your kind attention. Uh, very little. I, I admit that there are parts of his career that uh, I didn't even touch on uh, in the, in the uh, available space. Uh, but I know that there was some association, so I'm hoping someone can enlighten me. Can you, by any chance? Thank you. Right. If you, if you listen to a Jack Hilton orchestra uh, record, which is just a dance band, sorry to lower the tone, um, but if you get Not just a, any few, dance band, however. a few bars of oboe solo, it's Goosens. It is said from, as I say, about 1928, 1929. Oh, 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 Would that sink? Yes? Uh, that Jack was Hilton was his brother was quite... Leon. Hmm? That was his brother Leon who liked uh, money as much as the next man. And, well, uh, they had to make a living somehow, didn't they? Yeah, um, absolutely. So it would have been his brother. You right. Leon, you was the, Leon, during his lifetime, was generally regarded as the most distinguished orchestral oboist and even uh, a solo oboist uh, that, then living. His sister was a harpist. One brother was a horn player who didn't persist in the, in the trade. Eugene himself played the fiddle and probably played the piano, but that's, as far as I know, he never, never played the oboe. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, Mr. Smolian. I'm wondering how much, I'm sorry, I'm wondering how much influence the years of routine conducting of a ballet company influenced the way that he and Doherty and perhaps some of the other conductors who made their livings principally that way for a while uh, affected the way they approached ballet music and other music, uh, particularly dealing with uh, transitions uh, that would uh, uh, perhaps be more generously phrased by someone not as, uh, I'm making a judgment here, of course, uh, someone who does not have the strong uh, background in ballet conducting. Well, I think it wasn't just the fact that he conducted ballet, although he didn't necessarily conduct it for that long, but he was a jobbing musician for a number of years uh, and would have taken engagement anywhere. The fact that it was, however, he was the scion of two conductors who were immensely practical musicians and knew how to bring off effects with any type of uh, orchestra, and God knows the orchestras in the... Uh, uh, English opera companies and ballet companies in the late 19th century were not virtuosi but, uh, as a general rule. So, I mean, they learned how to achieve effects under sometimes trying practical circumstances. As far as how they shaped his performance style, I think uh, he favored uh, fast tempos as, as did Rojinsky. It was, a, it was common at the time to move things along. The phlegm that has crept into concert music in the past 50 years did not exist at that time. And so, you know, an occasional conductor uh, might indulge in slow tempos, but he was known for that, and it was hardly considered the norm. I'm not speaking of the tempo. Okay. But as a consistency of tempo within a segment, particularly ballet. Well, he... Any practical ballet uh, conductor accommodates himself to his dancers. So that, but on the other hand, there are ballet tempos in Stravinsky, and then there are concert tempos, which have become customary when the ballets became concert pieces. Yeah, okay. But no, that's a well-known dichotomy that's existed now for a long time, and we occasionally get uh, conductors who still want to play ballet tempos in concert, which results in a slightly logy Sacre du Printemps or Petrushka. Yes, Gary. Dennis, do you know how much rehearsal time he had for his Everest sessions? 
No, but Lon might know better, and he's been in the audience somewhere. Would, uh, So far as I've been able to find out, both in conversations with Michael Gray, who did the initial work on with the managements of the London Philharmonic and the London Symphony for the Everest recordings, all of the rehearsal work was done at the same time the sessions took place. So they do a rehearsal and then record a movement, rehearse some more, do the next movement, and so on. So it was very fast. That was the customary British Union stipulation, is you had to rehearse and then record. The, the, reason, the reason I ask is because uh, although most of his Everest recordings are very good, the Rite of Spring is really a mess. The orchestra, they, they sound like he and the orchestra were reading the piece down. I think it's also possible rolling. that he was a mess by that time. After yeah. all, between cardiac and liver conditions, which eventually brought him down, uh, he, al he didn't always arrive at those sessions in the best of shape. I haven't thought about the Rite of Spring, but uh, in some of the notes we found uh, that Ruth White had, uh, it was mentioned that Goosens was not always in good physical condition for some of the sessions. That was, that was a polite statement, yes. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, being uh, given the hook here, so I think if anyone has further questions, please poll me out in the hallway. I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks again.